Chapter 8 Homeless What are they doing here? Dirk muttered to himself. This isn't how it's supposed to go. He grabbed the thin purple book from his pocket, held it close to his face, and began frantically leafing through it. Acorn was pretty much going apeshit at the side of Anna, just freaking the fuck out, as ponies are wont to do. Christ, he was just, uh, he was all over the place. Jesus. Fucking ponies, man. Gene Betancourt, accustomed to such pony-related fuckery, managed to circumvent Acorn's freakout and gingerly approached the pony pals, as if uncertain that it was really them. Minos just sat there, watching, shitting, at a glacial pace. He knew that now was the time to listen, because he, like almost everyone else there, had no idea what the fuck was going on. "'Is it really you?' Jean Betancourt asked as she reached the girls. "'I can't believe I finally get to meet you.' And who the fuck are you exactly? Anna said, poking an accusatory finger at Betancourt's chest. Pam and Pawnee stood behind Anna on either side and crossed their arms to help Anna look like a maximum badass. And she did. Oh, she did. You are Anna Harley, yes? Betancourt said. And you two? She glanced at the other girls and gave them a quick wave. Are Pam and Lulu. The three of you live in Wiggins, which is a great name for a town, and go on all sorts of fun adventures with your ponies and you. Anna? Anna, oh my god, are you all right? The instant Jean Betancourt had said Lulu, Anna's eyes had gone pure white, and she now slowly toppled to the ground. Pam immediately knelt at her side. Anna, she shouted, shaking her friend by both shoulders. Don't you dare die again. Don't you fucking dare. Pam rained a shower of tears and blows onto Anna's chest from her eyes and fists, respectively. Anna, you son of a bitch, you can't do this to me. Pawnee, however, didn't so much as glance at Anna's prone body. She had her mind on only one thing, vengeance. While Pam berated slash tended to their friend, Pawnee marched straight to Jean Betancourt and got all up in her business. I don't know who the fuck you think you are, she hissed at the author, but you're wrapped up in all this somehow. You're in league with that fucking cat and whoever that douche in the pointy shades is. She slowly walked forward, step by accusatory step, forcing Betancourt to inch backwards until her back was pressed up against one of the chalky trees that circumscribed the clearing. And my name is not Lulu, she continued. It's Pawnee fucking Indiana. And my father is Ron motherfucking Swanson. And don't you fucking dare tell me any different. Got it? The whole scene looked like some sort of goddamn medieval triptych that illustrated the three primal human emotions. The anger of a wronged victim confronting her tormentor. The compassion of a lover caring for her injured friend. And, of course, the most powerful emotion of all, a pony flapping around and going nuts while a cat watches and poops. If Michelangelo and Picasso had been in that clearing, they would have wept at the beauty of it all, and then would have started to make out due to their pure shared stupefaction. Dirk stood aloof on the outskirts of the chaos, reading, listening, thinking. In our triptych metaphor, he's the frame, I guess? That works pretty well, actually. Eventually, he came to a decision. He shut the book, quietly sidestepped over to Minos, and leaned down and whispered with urgency, Hey, cat. Minos. Cat. Minos looked up at him and blinked. Yes, he said calmly. We need to judge Acorn now, like right on the immediate fuck now. Things are kind of getting out of hand in here, and I'm not entirely sure what's going on. I don't like that. But I've got a plan. I suspect that if we decide to erase Acorn right now, we can shut it all down, like an emergency eject button for the story. I was going to have us uh, protract the judgment process for another dozen pages, maybe, but talk about ancient Greek shit some more, more wordplay, of course, but it's pretty fucking clear that now we need to expedite the matter. Minos yawned. There are only the two of us here, Dirk. We need all three arbiters to make our ruling. And Jean, he gestured to the author, who was still being aggressively berated by the enraged town in Indiana, is otherwise occupied. It doesn't fucking matter, Dirk hissed. The vote just needs to be two out of three, and besides, her vote never really counted to begin with. She's a joke character. I just wrote her in as another facet of this fucking book to ridicule. She's not a real person. She's my projection of the kind of person who'd write... <sighs> Look, I'll lay it all out for you. Here's what happens, beat by beat. I'm listening, Minos said. 
Okay, so Betancourt votes to save Acorn. I vote to erase him. You want more evidence. I take us all in this bullshit wonderful life interlude. She's tricked into thinking that it's actually Acorn himself who fucked up the book so bad. She changes her vote. You have doubts, but respect that a majority has been reached. You wave your paws or whatever. Acorn's gone. The book starts falling apart even more. Jean realizes what's really happening, and the anvil of dramatic irony drops on her head. She was the creator. She becomes the destroyer. Finn. Then Appendix A, and then the final freakout, where Acorn tries to come back, and you and I band up to finish the job through pretentious meta bullshit contraptions. Finn again. Roll fucking credits. So let's just cut out the unnecessary bullshit and get it over with. Deal? Before I agree to anything, I do have one question, Mino said. What exactly did you mean earlier when you said you uh, wrote her in? Oh, motherfuck, Dirk sighed. Not you, too. I think I'm starting to understand what's really going on here. Minos got up and stretched out his front legs in that way that cats do. You know, the way, I'm sure. It's really cute. But this cat wasn't just being adorable. He was also being a straight dick. I bow down to you, O creator, Minos said sarcastically. Jesus Christ, Dirk said, rubbing his temples with a thumb and forefinger. Why did I have to make you such a smartass? Minos rolled onto his back and squirmed around like the cutest fucking asshole on the planet. I didn't say I wouldn't help you, he said. In fact, if what I suspect is indeed true, then I'd be quite the fool to try to work against you. At least you're a rational smartass, Dirk said. In the distance, Pawnee yipped a particularly shrill accusation at Jean Betancourt. Dirk glanced in their direction. We should make it quick, he said to Minos, before Pawnee rips off Betancourt's head or something. Both of them are just joke characters, really, but that makes them wild cards, and I don't want to risk having the original author die. And I'm not even going to make the obvious Roland Barthes joke here. That's how dead fucking serious I am. You're not actually worried about Betancourt, Minos observed. It's Anna who frightens you. Fine, her too, Dirk said. I'll admit it, I got in over my head. So let's just end this fucking thing before she wakes up from a revelation coma or whatever it is. Say, fuck Acorn, time to erase his ass or something like that and we'll be done. I mean, you should probably make it sound more formal, use some bigger words, but that's the gist of it. I can't, Mino said simply. God damn it! Dirk whispered. It's always something. At this point, the narrative realized that it had been neglecting the other five characters for too long, and with Dirk's attention elsewhere, the narrative shook free from the stranglehold he previously had on it, and it began to stretch its legs. Wander around a bit. Let's see what Acorn's up to, the narrative thought to itself. Acorn was still freaking the fuck out. Okay, not up to that much, the narrative thought. How about Pawnee and Jean Betancourt? That could be interesting. Maybe we're finally addressing how Pawnee is simultaneously a town and a girl. Like, what's up with that? Kind of switches back and forth, and sometimes it's both at once. I, I never asked about it, but it's been bugging me for a while. Oh, and I should also check them out, because that Betancourt woman apparently wrote me? But only half of me? I don't really know what's going on anymore. Population, 79,218. Incorporated in 1819. Pawnee was red in the face slash municipality. Median household income, $38,360. Sister city to Baracqua, Venezuela. Current mayor, Walter Gunderson. Official city tree, Indiana common shrub. Read my lips. Pawnee, motherfucking Indiana. Betancourt stood tall and haughty, refusing to be cowed any more by this city slash child. Lulu motherfucking Sanders, she countered. Short for Lucinda. Fifth grader at Wiggins Elementary, homeroom teacher, Mr. Livingston. Caretaker of the pony Snow White, who was owned by Mr. and Mrs. Baxter. Neither one is even listening to the other, the narrative realized. Looks like they're just in a holding pattern until other stuff's resolved. God, this story sucks right now. I guess I'll check on the other two girls, even though they're both just kind of lying over there on the ground. Uh, now that I think of it, the ground hasn't been very well described, really. It's just gray and misty. Like, does it have grass? Is it dirt? So dumb. You know what? I'm deciding that it's snow. There, that's canon now. Snow. <coughs> Pam had two fingers on Anna's neck, monitoring the girl's weak pulse. Pam was whispering things to her that were so private and passionate that even the newly liberated narrative couldn't listen in. Free indirect discourse holds no sway over those freer and more indirect than it. In a story full of secrets and complexities, maybe the most mysterious character of all is the most human, Pam Crandall. 
Anna's eyes were still wide open, but they were no longer white. Now they were rapidly changing, flickering quickly between different hues, different sizes, different degrees of brightness and cloudiness. It was as if the eyes of dozens of people were fighting for dominance inside the body of this one small girl. It was terrifying. Hey, what the fuck are you doing over there? Dirk shouted to the narrative. Get back inside my head. Christ, I can't leave you alone for two goddamn minutes. The narrative meekly complied. It also decided that it would never wander off on its own again because doing so was as confusing as it was self-indulgent. It would be best, the narrative thought, to treat this sequence as a stylistic flourish that isn't plot significant, just the flailing of an author who can't think of a natural way to handle so many characters in the same place, so he resorts to weird bullshit in the hopes no one will notice that it's masking incompetence. Minos looked bemused by Dirk's outburst. Is this another pretentious meta thing that I wouldn't understand? Dirk sighed. Yeah, pretty much. Things are really coming apart at the seams now. Unraveling. Which is why it's so fucking imperative that you help me. As I was saying before you began yelling at nothing, Mino said, I can't vote now because I never heard Acorn's sins. What the hell are you talking about? Dirk said. He knelt in the snow, cannon, to look Minos right in his bottomless kitty eyes. I read them all to you and Jean ten minutes ago. The cat sat up and shrugged. If you did, then I don't remember them. I'm sorry, but those are your own rules. We listen to you read the sins, then we judge. If I didn't hear the list, I can't, by the very logic that you wrote into our universe, make a ruling. Dirk uneasily looked around at the other characters in the dead forest clearing, knowing full well that any one of them could ruin everything if they got their act together and realized what was really happening. Fine, he said, looking back at the cat. I'll read them to you again. Will that fucking satisfy you? The cat nodded demurely. It certainly would. Dirk pulled the thin paperback volume out of his back pocket and began thumbing through it with a rapidity that suggested great familiarity. Multiple revisions prompted by care or by insecurity. Okay, bottom of page 53. We just finished the retrospectively unnecessary Socratic dialogue conceit and Acorn was being sassy. Betancourt told him not to be an asshole. Then on the next page... Dirk flipped to page 54 and immediately went silent. Minos jumped onto Dirk's shoulder and read out loud. The two girls in the town shrugged through the snow silently. Pawnee and Pam had left lightning a little said behind miles ago. Dirk was very still. That's not right, though. Pages 54 and 55, that's where I read all the sins out loud. It's just a really long list in an eye unreadably tiny font. That's the joke. The cat arched its eyebrows. Tiny font is a joke? Dirk waved a hand at the animal on his shoulder dismissively. But now 54 is about the girls. Their story was supposed to end permanently on page 43 when Acorn leaves. It's not about them anymore. They're no longer relevant. Maybe they didn't want it to not be about them. Maybe there's more to the Pony Pals than you thought. After all, they somehow made it here. Dirk shut the book, stood, and closed his eyes. No one could tell he had closed his eyes because of his sunglasses, but I know because I'm him. So trust me, he closed his fucking eyes. Now is not the right time to start questioning my slash his slash our objectivity. I status shut tighter than something that's really tight. I don't have time for these elaborate similes anymore. <clears throat> okay, Dirk said after a few seconds. Okay, new plan. I can still make this work. I've got it under control. Just as long as... And that's when Anna woke up. Anna's eyes, which had been flickering wildly, suddenly snapped back to their usual deep, cloudy brown. But now there was an otherworldly glow bordering her irises as if a power inside Anna's skull was struggling to escape, but was being held in check by the girl's willpower alone. She began to stand. Pam, kneeling by her in the snow, gasped in shock and relief, and cautiously scooted away. To be completely honest, Pam's gasp was due to shock, relief, and fear. So much fear. As Anna stood, her robotic arm did not come with her. It remained on the cold ground, lifeless and motionless metal once more. Covering the stump where the cybernetic arm had previously connected to Anna's shoulder, there was now a shimmering glaze of the same slowly pulsing light that struggled behind the girl's eyes. Again, as with the eyes, Anna seemed to be holding this power back, keeping it from shooting out of her shoulder in a solid beam of chaotic creation. Anna looked around the clearing as if seeing it and everything for the first time. The cat and the boy had stopped their conversation to stare at her, as had the city and the woman. Even Acorn had stopped his nonsensical horse bullshit to watch Anna Harley, Pony Pal. Anna walked to the center of the clearing and tilted her head to the sky. 
She spoke in an icily sharp voice. I am become author, destroyer of texts. At last the knight listened. At last it was silent. And then it was silent no longer. Every small noise was audible now, practically to the point of being visible. Sounds etched in bas-relief, like the grooves on a record or the pins on the cylinder of a music box. You could almost see them embedded in the heavy, viscous air, the crunching snow under Pam's feet as she cautiously stood up. The quiet, whispered stream of fuck, 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 fuck that tumbled from Dirk's lips like an obscene waterfall. The swish of Minos's tail, once again emulating that eternal pendulum. Pawnee and Jean Betancourt's little grunts as they angrily bumped each other with their shoulders continuing their argument pettily and non-verbally, and, of course, acorned the pony's huge gulping breaths of air as he recovered from his final freakout. Acorn, Anna said, as she fixed her phantasmagorical gaze on her pony, I'm glad I got to see you again. She slowly walked to the pony and put her hand on his mane, stroking it lovingly. Acorn rested his head on Anna's shoulder and nuzzled her neck. He, too, was thankful for this moment and he, too, knew its cost. Like Pam's earlier speech to Anna, this moment was too private, no, too sacred, to eavesdrop on. The silvery light began to drip from Anna's shoulder, each drop bursting into a flash of prismatic rays as it hit the ground. She and the pony were, it was still hidden, too sacred, too secret, sacrosanct, sacrament. Acorn was sacrament, consecrate, desecrate, desiccate, dissociate. Why can't I describe what's happening? It's describing itself. At last, Anna pulled away from Acorn. She stood on tiptoe, whispered one last secret in his ear, then stepped backwards away from him. She kept her hand on his mane as long as she could and left it outstretched for several moments after the contact broke. Anna once again stood in the middle of the clearing, the middle of the universe. She gazed at the pony she loved more than anything, including herself. Now, she whispered. Immediately, Acorn sprung into action. He moved with the preternatural speed and agility, a machine of oiled muscle, a brilliant quicksilver torrent, a cascade of light and flesh and sound, a god, a god. He first ran to Jean Betancourt, grabbed the back of her jacket in his puissant jaws, and with one sleek movement of his head, tossed her over his shoulder so she landed perfectly on his back. She instinctively grabbed onto his mane as he began to race towards his next target. Minos was more than ready. As Acorn passed, the cat fluidly leapt onto the pony's flank. He dug his claws in deep. Acorn bled. Neither cared. Finally, Acorn turned to Dirk. Through his shades, Dirk saw Acorn's horrifying face rushing towards him, lips pulled back, mane whirling, eyes frothing, ears billowing, hooves pulverizing, legs pumping like the pistons in the engine of a hearse. One horsepower was more than enough to drive this hearse horse on his journey to the grave and back again. This was the nay-nigh celestial body of an animal who would run into a burning barn, not out of stupidity, but out of defiance, out of refusal to believe that the flames could so much as singe him. Acorn had become Oak. Dirk was fucking scared shitless. But Acorn didn't touch Dirk at all as he sped past. Instead, he precisely plucked the book from Dirk's hands and continued on his thunderous way. Acorn held the paperback between his teeth as he galloped out of the forest. Following the trail, the pony pals cleared. This was a pony. This was a fucking pony. Again the silence. Again the stillness. Dirk and the three pony pals stood alone in the clearing, bodies tense, minds tenser. The stasis was finally broken when Pam walked over to Anna and put a hand on her left shoulder, being careful to avoid the mysterious shimmering fluid that was now falling from Anna in a steady trickle. Pawnee quickly joined them, grabbing onto Anna's other shoulder. This wasn't the Anna that they had known and had maybe loved, but whoever had now joined her in this body, Pam and Pawnee trusted them. Okay, what the fuck went down just now? Dirk asked. I've seen some bullshit, but this is bullshit. Anna shivered, the light pouring from her dimmed until it was just the faintest flicker that occasionally radiated from her eyes. The stump of her left arm was once again bare flesh. Pam began to remove her coat so Anna could cover it with a sleeve, but Anna shook her head and pointed at Dirk. I want him to see it. 
Still don't know what's happening, but now I'm even more weirded out than I was before, Dirk mumbled. Yeah, you can add me to the list of people who want to know what the fuck's going on, Pawnee said as she and Pam drew back their hands. And I'm pretty damn sure you're on that list too, Pam. Pam was silent. Then let me explain, Anna said. I'll explain it all. Okay, good. Info dump time, Dirk said, inching closer to the girl, the town, and the... Whatever it was that Anna had become. And let's just go through the highlight reel, since I'm pretty sure that letting those three fuckers hold on to that book for too long isn't the greatest of all conceivable ideas. So give it to me bounded in a nutshell, even though this dream is bad enough that I highly doubt I can become the king of infinite space. Another sharp burst of the mysterious light shot from Anna's eyes, and her irises rapidly flickered through another 18 permutations of colors, shades, and sizes before once more settling down. Anna smiled. Thank you, she said. Dirk started rubbing his temples again. Jesus, this rabbit hole just keeps getting deeper and darker and shittier, even without that Cheshire motherfucker hanging around here. Yet another flash from Anna's eyes. Pawnee tugged on the sleeve of Anna's shirt. We probably should actually hurry up. We still need to save Acorn, right? Acorn's gone now, Anna said softly. He no longer belongs here or anywhere. In other words, he's homeless. That was the last time I'll ever see him. But there's more at stake here than Acorn's soul. So much more. Pam hesitantly nodded. Yes, she whispered, then looked surprised at the words she had said. First answer, Anna said to Dirk. Why and how I'm here. I actually have you to thank for that, Dirk. By killing me, you sent me to the other side of the other side. I know you think that phrase is just a little playful combination of words that doesn't mean anything, but it does. You removed me from the story, but only temporarily. On my way out of and my way back through the other side, I passed through all the layers of other texts surrounding this one. Other texts, Pawnee said, reaching for her flask before realizing that she drained it and the five others she carried on her at all times and tossed it aside hours ago. The fuck do you mean, other texts? Yes, Dirk said menacingly, advancing a few steps. What do you mean? Because if you mean what I think you do, then saying so would maybe be the most self-indulgent thing of all in this already incredibly self-indulgent clusterfuck. Anna ignored him. This is a text, Pawnee, she said. We're characters in a book. Well, not exactly. It's complicated. But I'll explain that later. The point is, Dirk, that you killed me, then brought me back. That's the key. Because in destroying me, you created me anew. But why only you? Dirk asked. I killed and revived Minos, too, several times. And there were even more than I killed and left dead. What's special about you? Anna grinned. I'm dyslexic. Detective Pony was originally written by Jean Betancourt. The first two pages were altered by Andrew Hussey, pretending to be Dirk Strider. The rest of the pages were altered by Sonnet Stuck, also pretending to be Dirk Strider. The book is read by Duckface as yet another person pretending to be Dirk Strider, and Naked Bee as Jean Betancourt, a fourth character who may or may not be Dirk Strider. This recording was instigated, perpetrated, and assembled by Naked Bee. Okay, that was pretty good.